Hi class, today's video is going to introduce you to the topic of study. Um, well, two different topic of study, topics of study. First one will be uh, immigration policies in America from 1880s through 1900s. And then the second one is going to be on the foreign policy or American actions internationally during those same years. Um, and both of these are connected by an idea, a theory, ideology known as social Darwinism. And today throughout class, I will explain to you what that means. Um, we have to first say that social Darwinism is something that was popular in America in late 19th century, early 20th century. The theory was so influential that again, the lawmakers will apply it when they were constructing new laws on immigration. And it will also have consequences on American foreign policy in that American government will use the theory of social Darwinism to conquer, to control other countries. So again, we refer to that as colonialism or as imperialism. So the idea was so strong and it was so influential that it would make America think about expanding its borders, conquering different countries. Um, and those who adhered to theories of social Darwinism uh, will see American expansion, will see American domination of other nations as um, a, an effort that it's necessary because these are weaker countries. We view them as weaker countries. And that is like the natural order or natural outcome of this struggle for survival and dominance. So we will see throughout the lecture today and you will see through some other readings you will do how this is a super problematic theory. Uh, in just a moment, I will provide you with a more strict definition of social Darwinism. But before we do that, we have to understand the root of this idea. And the origin of social Darwinism, um, you may look at the word Darwinism and think, oh, um, it kind of sounds familiar. And the reason why it may sound familiar is because you may have heard of the English scientist called Charles Darwin. So he was kind of living and prolific, active in um, 19th century. And specifically in 1859, he published then very controversial to some people still controversial book called On the Origin of Species. And this book will have very deep, profound consequences on, yes, science and scientific world, but also to the world of politics and societies in America and Europe. But basically, in this book, Charles Darwin provides biological theories, right? Biological explanations about living organisms. And he will say that according to the laws of nature, all organisms produce more offspring. They have more babies, more offspring, and then are able to survive. And he said that out of those organisms that are born, only those with the stronger characteristics will tend to live, will tend to survive, will thrive. And all of the weaker organisms will perish. They will die because of, you know, diseases, maybe natural disasters or predators will get them. And this process, process of, you know, the stronger, the strongest living and the weaker dying will be referred to as the process of natural selection. And later, some scientists will dub it as the survival of the fittest theory. So the Darwin wrote, the vigorous, the healthy, and the happy will survive and multiply, right? So the vigorous, the healthy are the fittest to survive. And this is how species continues to evolve, right? So this process of who lives and who dies is in essence, a process of natural selection. It's kind of like um, a nature's way of filtering out, quote unquote, the weaker organisms and ensuring that only the stronger ones will continue to live, right? And when he publishes this theory in like late 19th century or mid 19th century, he will say that this theory of natural selection 
applies only to biological phenomena, right? So like natural selection of plants and animals. Okay, so that's what he said. However, some people will take what he said from the origin of species and they will use those words to misconstrue them and to misapply, to wrongly apply the process of natural selection and to make theories about how societies are supposed to be organized. And this is what we call social Darwinism, right? So think about um, social Darwinism as misapplication of Charles Darwin's ideas, meaning wrongful use of his ideas of human evolution and applying it to humans, applying it to how human societies are supposed to be organized, right? So social Darwinism responds with uh, Darwin's theory of natural selection, which explains process of biological evolution. So how the fittest bird is going to survive than the weaker bird, right? And then you have a group of people social Darwinists who will take this theory and apply this theory to human societies, right? So some scientists in Europe and America, but not Charles Darwin, right, will take these biological concepts of natural selection, of uh, survival of the fittest introduced by Charles Darwin, and they will apply it to the study of societies, okay? So how should politics work? How, what kind of social hierarchies should we have? So who is on the top and who is on the bottom amongst humans, right? Um, also social Darwinists may pose theories about what kinds of societies are naturally better, naturally more fit to survive, right? So you can already see some red flags in this, I'm hoping. Um, so social Darwinism, by definition, I like to think of it as a fake social science or very problematic theory that applies principles of this biological evolution to human societies, saying that <clears throat> different societies in humans will compete with each other for survival um, and some human societies will kind of naturally be better at this competition than others, right? So it is to say that some people, some societies, some nations that are economically or socially successful are by nature, it's like a law of nature, they are inherently more fit um, in how they evolved. And those that are less successful are deemed as less fit and it's nobody's fault. It's just that's who they are. That's who they naturally are, okay? And social Darwinists will also say that um, a competition is our natural state. It's our state of nature, right? We will always compete with one another. And they will say that's actually good. So competition is necessary. But the reason why competition is necessary, social Darwinists will say, is because that is the way of us weeding out or getting rid of those who are less fit than us. Okay? So... People who are poor, people, maybe racial minorities, maybe religious minorities, maybe people with disabilities, anybody who stands out of what people define as quote unquote norm or as normal and desirable will be defined as less fit and therefore it will be okay for us to leave them behind, right? Because that is again, quote unquote, the law of nature in the eyes of social Darwinists. So. Society can always move forward. They can progress only if we eliminate those that we think of as lesser or weaker. So, for example, if you are poor, if you are disabled, that is a sign of weakness and inferiority, right? This also may mean that government should not have responsibility, social Darwinists will say, to take care of them, to take care of the poor, to take or to help disabled, right? Why? Because if social institutions such as, I don't know, welfare, right, would allow those quote unquote inferior humans, inferior in the eyes of social Darwinists, right, to survive um, and to reproduce at higher levels, 
than humans who are physically stronger, then they become a burden on the society, right? If we help the poor, if we help the disabled, we may prevent stronger individuals from thriving and stronger individuals um, will have their opportunities taken away if we are sit in, if we are sitting in a back and trying to help those who may be struggling, right? So maybe I'm hoping that you are seeing some red flags in this, right? And and ways in which social Darwinism may be very problematic as as a theory and as something we should be applying to public policy. Okay. Now, if we want to name some names of people who were social Darwinists, again, Charles Darwin was not one of them. It's not his fault that some people took his biological theories about survival of the fittest plants and animals to how humans should also be organized as people. Um, two people who will take Charles Darwin's ideas and misapply them, or we may call them the two original social Darwinists are Herbert Spencer and William Sumner. Who were they? They basically are kind of scientists too, just like Charles Darwin. Um, Herbert Spencer was from Great Britain. He was an um, anthropologist, so somebody who studies you know, societies, human societies. And Sumner was an American professor of social sciences at University of Yale. So two folks who are you know, really kind of reputable, who um, have a wide audience, broad audience, people who listen to them, who trust them, that what they say is actually true because they're supposed to be the experts um, in their own fields, right? So these two social Darwinists believe that, again, according to the survival of the fittest theory, certain people naturally become stronger and powerful in society um, because they're just simply born better, right? And through the process of natural selection, they become naturally superior to the others. You may already see where this is going, right? It was basically, it could be applied as a theory of superiority of one nation, of one race, of one religious category of humans to be better as others, right? So they will kind of form this idea of how social Darwinism can lead to forms of discrimination to, again, justify, quote unquote, fitness of some people um, over others. And in America, that think of, you know, what kinds of issues were troubling America in late 19th century. We just got out of the war, civil war. We still are trying to grapple with how to expand rights and liberties to formerly enslaved people, right? So you also learned about how during Reconstruction and after Reconstruction, there was a push against uh, or hate towards African-Americans specifically. So naturally, when you represent or present these kinds of ideas of social Darwinism to people, in America, what was seen as deemed as desirable by social Darwinists is someone who is typically white, right? So we are simply providing arguments in favor of white supremacy, right? And we are saying that, oh, white people are better and you know this this is science okay so they, they are scientifically like we can scientifically prove with social darwinism that white race is better okay so this this is the mindset of the social darwinists okay now in regards to um impact of this ideology of this idea um, as I said in the introduction, social Darwinism was often used to justify various forms of inequality, um, various forms of discrimination, including eugenics, including uh, racism, including even imperialism. If we think of imperialism as something problematic, like conquering other nations and telling them, oh, we are better, we need to conquer you because we are better, we are doing things better, so you need to, you know, uh, um, you need to 
conform conform with our own ways. You need to become like us because our culture is better and that's why we are conquering you, right? So it's going to provide rationale for exploitation of different resources, like we're coming to different countries and taking their resources and then we're telling them, oh, you know, you need to think, become, speak like Americans because we think that this way is better. Um, and the subjugation of those peoples we are conquering, right? So we need to colonize the world to show that we are stronger, that we are superior as American culture. Um, and also we will try to weed out some of the immigrants out of America through different laws and legislations, as you shall see in the next video, right? But before this video ends, I want to give you an example of arguments by social Darwinists so you can see their own words and what the kinds of things they were saying. Um, so in terms of primary sources, we have a quote of the speech from William Sumner. Remember, he was one of the founders of social Darwinism. And again, uh, he will be this professor of social studies at Yale University, so somebody with a high reputation. And he said, quote, we shall favor the survival of the unfittest, and we shall accomplish this by destroying liberty. Let it be understood that we cannot go outside of this alternative. Liberty, inequality, survival of the fittest and not liberty, equality, and survival of the unfittest. The former carries society forward and, the, and favors all its best numbers, and the latter carries society downwards and favors its worst members. So again, when he says the former carries societies forward, he's referring to the first group of people he spoke of in this quote, right? So liberty, inequality and survival of the fittest. So the fittest people are the ones who are carrying society forward, who ensure that we uh, have progress. And the latter, meaning the quote unquote unfittest, um, if we focus on helping them, again, we are going to be destroying our society, okay? So here he, he uses the word, he plays with the word equality, right? You can also see from this how this is an argument against equality of all people, because he argues we are not all equal, we should not be all equal through policies, through actions of the government, because if we try to enforce that, then we will impede, we will slow down the progress of societies, right? So again, I hope this um, this brief explanation was able to show you a definition of social Darwinism, the roots of social Darwinism, um, examples of the kinds of thoughts that social Darwinism will introduce with its founders. Um, and I hope that in next video, you will get even more understanding of what social Darwinism is by me providing you a specific example of this policy or this idea in action.